Okay, let's just pray. Father, we thank you that you're a God who knows us, who knows every detail of our life. We thank you, God, that your heart for us is always good. We pray this morning, Lord, that your word uh, will just uh, reach into our heart, that your spirit will apply it as you want. And Lord, that your word will truly prosper in all that you send it to do, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I'm just going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Dear brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come preaching God's message with fancy words or a show of human wisdom. I decided that while I was with you, I would forget about everything except Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. So when I came to you, I was weak and fearful and trembling. My teaching and preaching were not with words of human wisdom, that persuade people, but with proof of the power that the Spirit gives. This was so your faith would be in God's power and not in human wisdom. God's a God who answers prayer. I was sharing with a couple of guys this morning um, an email that I received, um, and it was about an incident that happened in the United States recently where a, um, a church, it was a Baptist church, and next door to them, they'd um, had a brothel operating for a while. And this building, and they decided that they were going to extend the brothel's building. And so the church got in and prayed. And they prayed and they prayed, but the building went ahead and it came to the opening day. And on the opening day, there was a massive storm. The building was struck by lightning and burned down. And the brothel owners sued the church and said that directly or indirectly, you were responsible. <laughs> the church went to court and said, no, nah, that's rubbish. Of course we're not responsible. And the judge said, I've got a problem. I'm not sure how I'll deal with this. I've got a brothel owner who believes in the power of prayer and a church that denies it completely. We need to make sure that we're a people who believe, who believe in the power of prayer, who believe that we've got a God who answers prayer, and a God who wants to meet us where we are. We've been talking about community as a means by which God empowers his church, his people, all to accomplish his purpose. Last time we talked a bit about speaking the, the language of the kingdom, language of our house. We're a Bible-believing people. We're a people who've been redeemed by God from many tribes, many peoples and many nations as we look across the face of this church. We can see that. And we've been made one in Christ. And that is part of who we are. And that's part of our language. We also noted last time that we are Pentecostal people. And we believe in the operation and the power of of the Holy Spirit working in us and through us. We believe in the power of prayer. We believe that God answers prayer. We believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. God communing with us and communicating with us as his people. We believe it. We speak it. That's who we are. That's what we are. That's the way we speak. That's our language. It's one we don't want to lose or compromise as we talked about last time. This morning I, I want to pursue some of that just a little bit further and touch a couple of related kingdom principles. As Christians, we've got to figure out how God moves, the way he moves, and we've got to move in that way. We've got to know what God says. We've got to hear his voice. And we've got to speak in that way. We've got to do the things God does. We've got to say the thing. God does. We've got to think the way God thinks. Now, in order for us to truly do that, we need to know him extremely well. One of the things that we're told is that we have, in, in verse 16 of the passage that we were actually looking at, 
who has known the mind of the Lord, who has been able to teach him. But we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. And it's important in these days in which we live that we put on that, that mind of Christ because our own minds, our own ways, our own thoughts, our own perspectives fall a long way short of the glory of God. We know that of ourselves we just don't crack it. But knowing him and allowing him to work in us and through us, that's the way it ought to be. The Bible says that his ways are above our ways and his thoughts above our thoughts. So in order for us to be kingdom-minded, we've got to tap in in some way into, into the DNA of God. And we've got to be able to reflect his image. And to do that, we need to make sure that we put on that mind of Christ to speak like him and to be like him. You know, it's said that if you want to learn a foreign language, the test of fluency is whether or not you can dream in that language. That's the, that's the test of fluency. Can you dream in the language that you've learned? So let's ask a question. Do we dream kingdom dreams? What's your dream? What's your dream? Do I dream in the language of the kingdom? Am I fluent in that? Is that, is, is that my heart? And is that what is occupying my thought? What really occupies me in my dreaming time as well as my waking time? Paul understood this principle. He was one of the greatest theologians of his day. The greatest teacher of all, a fellow named Gamaliel or Gamaliel. Everybody pronounces it differently. But Gamaliel do me. That's why I've always said it. He was the world's greatest teacher or as far as Israel was concerned. And Gamaliel had taught Paul. Paul became what was known as the Pharisee's Pharisee. He studied the law day and night. He knew the Torah. He knew it inside out. He knew it, I was going to say front to back, but he knew it back to front. <laughs> um, great. We'll need somebody out there to fix that for us, please. Yeah, he, uh, he knew it back to front. As Henry Higgins famously said in My Fair Lady, the Hebrews read backwards, which is absolutely frightening. <laughs> Paul was, was the most qualified of all of the, the Pharisees in the land. Not only was he a very learned man, but he knew how to speak as well. He was proficient in reading the scriptures and in preaching in public and in the synagogue. If Paul was alive today, I guess we would say that he had several doctorates in theology and ministry and divinity, communication and probably law. He would have made Billy Graham look like a first-year Bible college student, I'd reckon. Make all of us look, look ignorant. Maybe as though we'd just started Sunday school or something. Paul was the man. He was the man. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. He was the first missionary. He was shipwrecked three times and survived every time. He saw the first converts come into the church. He saw prison doors open when he sang hymns in the prison with Silas in, in, the, in the cell. Now, I can certainly understand if I was singing or some of us were singing. I can understand the windows breaking, but not doors Falling off hinges, that's just too much. Paul knew what he was talking about. Now you might say to yourself, well that's alright, but I'm no Paul. I might be Peter, but I'm no Paul. I might be Peter when, when the cock crows. You know, I'm, I might back off quite a bit when I'm out there in the world. You might say, well, you've got little or no education. Maybe you've had some training, but in other things. 
You look at the Word of God and you see yourself as being hopelessly unqualified to declare the life and the power of the kingdom, unqualified to pray for the sick, to evangelize your family and your neighbors, your workplace, your school, uni. But I want us this morning to grab one of the realities of kingdom life. It is not what you know. It's who you know that counts. That's what qualifies you in the university of the spirit. It's who you know. It's where your heart is. It's to do with the language that you speak. One of the things that um, John Eliano said yesterday at the seminar thought was a, a really valuable thing for us to grab. He said, with evangelism, we have made it down through the years. We've said to the church, what we've got to do is go and win souls for Christ. Well, we don't. That's not what the Bible says. And John was spot on with that. Not what the Bible says. Our job is to go and declare the gospel. God's job is to get people saved. We can't do that. We can't bring them to salvation. We can just declare the gospel. So you might say, well, I've never led anyone to Christ. But I want to tell you, if you have spoken to somebody and shared Christ with them, you have successfully fulfilled the commission that you've been given. So never think that you can't do it. Never think that your efforts either <clears throat> won't be good enough or haven't been good enough. Because it's not what you know, it's who you know. And when the one that you know is the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, then church, I want to tell you, you're in business. You're in kingdom business. When you can refer to the creator of the universe as Abba, Daddy, when you can look at the, the ugliest demonic presence and say, my daddy's bigger than yours. When you can say that you've got a friend in Jesus, a friend whose relationship is closer to you than that of a brother, then church, you've got a friend in high places. When you can testify that you have an advocate who stands before heaven's throne, not only to plead your case, but to pay your penalty, pay the price for your guilt with his own blood. You've got a friend in high places and you should never forget it. When you can look in the word of God and hear God saying, you're the apple of my eye. You're my greatest masterpiece. You've got a friend in high places. But I want to tell you, it's even better than that for us. Not only do we have a friend in high places, but we are there ourselves. We are seated in Christ in heavenly places. Understand to, to do what God has asked us to do, to fulfill the commission, to go and share with people the gospel of Jesus Christ. You don't need to get some degree from a theological cemetery, a seminary. <laughs> you already right now possess absolutely everything that you need to fulfill what God wants you to do now. You can love him and you can live for him and you can serve him and you can cause heaven to be released into your part of this earth. You have the authority of the Father. You have the mind of the Son and the power of the Holy Spirit operating in your life right now. And all we need to do is step out in obedience and share the gospel with people. Sure, I understand. God may have some things planned for you in the future that may require you to be trained in some certain thing. But no matter what happens, no matter what happens right now where you are in the kingdom, God has equipped you to fulfill what he has in the present for you to do. Not because of what you know, but because of who you know. Now let's be reminded that the Bible teaches that one man sows and another can water, but only God 
can give the increase. Only God is able to produce that fruit. Your job is to go and to tell the people, to declare the kingdom. And maybe that's all it will take for someone. Maybe there's someone that just needs to hear the gospel from you. And you never know if you're that one chance that that person has. Maybe they've heard it a dozen times. Hundreds of times, I don't know. But sometimes it just needs to come at the right time from the right person in the right circumstance and that could be you where you are in this present time. You might be the one that has the answer for someone. We just need sometimes for people to, to say the same thing that others have said to them and that will touch them. Sometimes we need to, to simply show what the kingdom is about by our love and acceptance and forgiveness. Maybe you might know somebody or see somebody who is sick and, and you might pray for them for healing. And then they're confronted with the power of the kingdom as well as the message of love that you are sharing with them. And that seed that that you have sown or that somebody else has sown is watered. And you mightn't see the fruit right then, but somewhere along the line, as others continue to water that seed with the word of God, they can come to a place where they may enter into the kingdom and respond to the kingdom. And God can, can bring the increase and regenerate them, place kingdom life in their heart and bring them to birth. You can't do that, but God can. Now, I'm really glad that we can't do that. I'm really glad. One of the big hassles that, that I have, among many others, but one of the hassles that I have with, with infant baptism is that oftentimes when, when a child is, is christened, uh, they say that that now makes them a child of God. And that scares me because if you've got to have that happen to you to become a child of God, that puts the power of making somebody a child of God in the hands of man. So that means if I bring a baby to, to this man here and say, will you please christen my child so that this kid can get into heaven? And he says, no. He could condemn my kid forever. It'd be rather tragic, wouldn't it? Salvation's never put in our hands under any circumstance. All we can do is share the gospel and God does the rest. We just go and we might even put ourselves back into, into kindergarten at school. We go and play show and tell with people. Show them the gospel. Tell them the gospel. Pray for them. And let God do the rest. To experience the power of God, all we've got to do is make ourselves available to Him and to declare His word by word and action. Now in the passage that we read uh, at the beginning in 1 Corinthians, we find Paul speaking to the church at Corinth, the church that he himself had been part of establishing. He planted the church years earlier. Now, I want you to to particularly listen to this thing that he said. Dear brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come preaching God's message with fancy words or show of human wisdom. This is really an amazing statement from somebody like Paul. Because here we've got this mighty man, this, this man of incredible knowledge, of, of brilliant oratory skill. We have this theologian, church planner, missionary, author. One who probably understood the most profound doctrinal truths that you could wrap your mind about. And he declares what? He says, it's not what you know, it's who you know. I didn't come with all the words that I've got. What I came to you with 
was the power of God. Nothing to do with me, not my words. Simply the power of God. He understood that everything that he possessed, all of the knowledge, all of that education, all of the titles that he had acquired, they were meaningless outside of the context of the power of God. Within his Christian walk, the power of God was the thing that mattered more than anything else. Please understand, church. You might not be the most eloquent speaker. You might not possess the, the skills that Paul had. You might not have some great skill or talent that will cause people to stop and to listen. But God can use you. Don't forget Moses had a speech problem. Abraham was too old. Sarah laughed at God's promises. Hosea's wife was a prostitute. Can you imagine that in the church? The prophet's wife is a prostitute. <laughs> Nobody's going to mind that, but I'll tell you what, the church is going to start rumors. How did they meet? <laughs> <laughs> Jacob was a liar. David was too young. And even when he got going with God, he had an affair. Naomi was a widow. Paul was a murderer. So was Moses. Jonah ran away from God in direct disobedience. Gideon doubted. Thomas just outright refused to believe. Jeremiah suffered from depression and he became suicidal. Elijah got burnt out. Noah got drunk. That's now. <laughs> Samson was a womanizer. So I mentioned that Moses had a bad temper as well. Lazarus was dead. <laughs> Is there anything that God can't do? Is there anyone he can't use? God used every one of them. He doesn't hire and fire like most bosses. He doesn't measure success by financial gain. He's not prejudiced. He's not partial. He just wants us to be available to him. You may not be considered to be wise in the eyes of men according to some standard. But God says that sometimes he uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. I can always find consolation myself in the fact that he spoke through a donkey. So I guess if he spoke through a donkey, then we're all usable. You see... There's something that actually happens when you begin to declare the testimony of God. When you start to speak in the language of the kingdom, something in the atmosphere changes. And that's what we've really been talking about, this, this speaking the language of the kingdom. It's not a language that's filled with some pious pontifications, of course, spoken in King James English. It's just a language that flows from the Holy Spirit. That's all it is. It's a language that's filled with excitement. And something begins to happen when we speak the language of the kingdom. Something happens when you allow the power of God to flow through your testimony. The power of God manifests itself, which of course is just a fancy way of showing, of saying that, that God shows up. When you start to speak about the things that, that he has done for you, God shows up. When you start to declare to people how he has changed your life, how he rearranged you, how he snagged you out of the pits of hell, how he took you out of the, the pits of despair that the world had put you in and he set your feet on a solid rock, as you start to share that, something happens. 
Something is released in the atmosphere. You start to share with people how he gave you a new life and a life that's abundant, a life that's full, a life that flows with the life and the power of his spirit. When you start to share with people how you see the sick heal and the oppressed being set free, something happens when you begin to express the language of the kingdom. Not the language that the world speaks, but the language of the kingdom. We are not just human beings having some spiritual experience. Understand it. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. And we can share the language that is our natural language, the language of the kingdom the language of grace, the language of love, the language of redemption, the language of the cross, the language, as Paul so eloquently put it, is determined, he was determined to talk about nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I want to tell you that there is a power in the gospel. There is a power in the message of the kingdom. And just like you and I, Paul had a past. Paul had given the order to kill Stephen. He had persecuted the church. He had a reputation, but then he met Jesus. And when Paul encountered Jesus on that Damascus road, all of his education, all of his speaking ability, all of his wisdom... All of his authority meant absolutely nothing as he encountered the risen Christ. And church, when we encounter him, we learn afresh. We're encouraged again to know it's not what you know, it's who you know. So Paul could say, I had a past. One day on the road to Damascus, I was surrounded by this marvellous light and fell to my knees and I had an encounter with Jesus and as a result of that, I was changed forever. That was Paul's testimony and I want to tell you that you too have a testimony. Regardless of your past, you have a testimony of the present. You have a testimony of what God has done for you and is doing for you and what he has promised to continue to do for you. And so I hear people around the place speaking and saying, I used to be a drug addict and now I'm a pastor. Well, that's great. That's great to hear. You hear people saying, I used to be a womanizer, but now I'm a husband and a father. But the reality is no matter what your past might be like, you've got a spotless future. And it's all because I'm a child of God. It's all because of Jesus. It's because he was crucified and paid the price for my sin. Regardless of what our past might have been. My past is forgiven. My future is secured. See, that's the simple language of the kingdom. See, we look and we see that the enemy We hear of this enemy as being the accuser of the brethren. And we know that Satan looks back at our past and sees our mistakes. But you see, when God looks back, he doesn't see our mistakes, he sees the cross. The devil comes and he says to us, you're not worthy. And Jesus says, hang on, that doesn't matter, I am. Because we have the life of Christ in us. At the end of the day, after all is said and done, we have a firm faith that is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. A sure foundation. We don't have to rest our faith on the words of some man. We can rest our faith in the power of God. That's the language of the kingdom. That's what we preach. That's what we want to live. That's the language of the house. We look to the power of the almighty God and we believe in him. We trust in him. And we expect to find in his presence the fullness of joy. 
We expect to find healing in his wings. We expect to find deliverance for the oppressed through his name. We unashamedly declare the language of the kingdom. And as I've said before, we speak it with a Pentecostal accent. We're a community of believers, not a community of doubters. Not a community of doubters. A community that assembles together to honour God. A community whose faith is in God's power and not human wisdom. We are an empowered community. We're a house with a deep desire to see God's kingdom flourishing here on earth. Lord, on earth as it is in heaven. That's the language of the house. I said last time, and I I say it again, I fear that the church, and I'm talking generally here, the church has tended in recent times to become quiet, almost submissive to the will of the world. Dare we speak out. Dare we stand up. Dare we offend. I don't want to offend anyone. But I can tell you now, the person I want to offend least of all is God. And I don't want to stand one day before God and find that there were things that I was supposed to do and just refused because I was afraid what the world might think. We live in a world that is changing, a world where morality is being redefined on every front. We need to constantly stand on what the Word of God says, not on the opinion of men, but on what the Word of God says. I become really concerned when I look into our community here in Armadale, let alone anywhere else, and see so many people that don't necessarily have a hope for eternity. Vast majority of people without hope for eternity. Now I know the gospel is not just about getting our fire insurance paid. There's a lot more to it than that. God doesn't just want us to have an eternity with him. That's part of what he wants for us. But God wants us to understand that that eternity that he wants to enjoy with us is not something that is confined to the future but is something that we should be experiencing now. We don't have to wait until we get to heaven to find what the glory of God is like. Sure, when we are able to see God in His, in His glory in that sense, we'll understand something better. And Yeah, we know that. We know that that's going to happen in the, in the future. But nonetheless, God wants us to experience walking with him now and communing with him now. We can walk and talk with God. We can hear his voice and we can respond to his prompting. So when he says, Mark, see that man over there? Go pray for him. You can go and do that. You never know. You never know the opportunities that God is going to put before you unless you're willing to listen to his voice. But there are people that I believe that God has has given you a key to and nobody else has that key. The Bible says that God has committed to us a word of reconciliation. God has committed to us a word of reconciliation. I want you to, to grab that and hear it. He has given to you the word 
that will reconcile some people to God. And I believe, and I take that so personally, that I believe that there are people that God has given to me a word to reconcile that person with God and he's not given it to anyone else. I'm their only hope. And there's people for whom you are the only hope. I think it was a few years ago that we screened a film here and the film was called Without Reservation. And it was a very simple story, fictitious of course, of a group of young people, five of them in a vehicle. One was a Christian and the others weren't. They had a car accident and they were all killed. And the movie took us to them in the afterlife. They were still in their car and there was this long line of people and and one of the people in the car said to the Christian young man, what's this, do you think? And he says, well, I I think it's probably a judgment line. He says, what's that? He said, well, you've got to determine whether you're going to go to heaven or hell. And the guy said, well, that's easy. I'll go to heaven. And the Christian boy said, well, it's actually not that easy. You had to make that decision before you died. And this bloke said, well, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me? And so as the story goes, they one by one come up and here is a guy at the, um, at the desk, I presume it's St Peter at the desk with his computer. And each person would come up to him and he'd say, what's your name? And they'd give their name and he'd look down the list and he'd say, your name's not here, step to the left please. And so, step to the left step to the left and then a Christian would come up and he'd go, ah yes you're here, step to the right please and this young Christian man came up and Peter checked, yes, step to the right please and then his mate came behind him, he looked down no, have no reservation step to the left please and the thing that always struck me about that movie more than anything else was at that point when the guy who was told to step to the left looked across and caught the eye of his Christian friend on his way to a different destination and the look of despair and the look of why why didn't you tell me was written all over his face there are people that only you will have a chance to bring to the Lord. I absolutely believe that. That's one of the reasons why, as I've said before, if you ring me up and say, can you come and lead this person to Christ? I'll say no. Because if you brought them that far, it's obviously God's purpose for you to do that. You've got a word for them that's going to bring them into the kingdom. Church, let's not be afraid. It's not what you know. It's who you know. And we need to be confident in who we know. We need to be confident in whose we are. We belong to him. Let's not be afraid to declare that. And so we say, is there anyone that is thirsty? Let them come and drink. The woman at the well didn't understand that. The woman at the well said to Jesus, can you get me a drink? And he said, woman, if only you knew, if only you understood, sure, I can put the bucket down for you and quench your your thirst, but I want to tell you by the time you walk back to town, you're going to be thirsty again. But if only you knew that the very one to whom you are speaking is one who has water 
that will cause you to never, ever thirst again. Never. And she said, oh, I'll have some of that. I'll have some of that. She didn't understand. And I want to tell you, church, that Jesus can quench your thirst in a way that nobody else ever could. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, let me say that the words that Jesus spoke on that what was called the great day, he said, if anyone is thirsty, let them come. And if you don't know Jesus, I want to tell you today, you can know him. You can know him personally. You can have a, a relationship with him that can change your life in the way that he's changed so many other lives. So if you don't know him personally, then don't miss that opportunity. Make today your Damascus road. Have an encounter with the living Christ. But I also say, church, if you don't know the power of the Holy Spirit moving in your life, that's not the way God intends you to live. He intends you to live knowing the power of the Holy Spirit, knowing that flow of the Holy Spirit. He intends you to live in communicating with Him in a heavenly language. Now, I've been reading some stuff lately with some people who've been... Um, saying that there is no such thing as baptism in the Holy Spirit. And I really find it interesting when I look at a lot of people who, who say this, they're so dry when you read their stuff. I was sharing, I won't go into details on this, but I was sharing with some people who had been involved uh, with a, uh, an evangelical group and, and it's great, they, they declare the gospel. But these people were saying to me, they're so dead. They're so dead. Why is that? I want to tell you why. Because the life is in the Holy Spirit. The life flow is in the Holy Spirit. The dunamis, the power of the Holy Spirit. I am so glad that there are so many people out there who know Jesus, even though they don't know the power of the Holy Spirit, they're going to share heaven with us. And that is fantastic. Uh, my dad, my mum and dad came into that category. They knew Jesus and they knew him well, but they denied the power of the Holy Spirit. I still believe, absolutely, I believe today that my mother would have lived if she'd had prayer for cancer when she the opportunity had been given so many times. But she just couldn't believe that. You know, she wouldn't, as I spoke with her, she just wouldn't let that happen. I went and I spoke to, um, some of you will know, Canon Jim Glennon uh, from St Andrew's Healing Ministry. And I spoke with Jim and, and he went up and to, to, to see my mum and, you know, sat down with her and talked with her and she was happy to talk with him but when it came to praying, no. And this was a Christian person. And like I said, she's with the Lord now. No risk at all. But missed out on so much. On so much. And I believe that, that on that day when I had the opportunity to pray for her and she finally said, yes, you can pray for me. And I was about to leap in all. And she said, but none of that faith healing stuff. <coughs> I believe she would have been healed. Lots of people who know Jesus. There are people out there in many churches around this town and, and this nation and the world at large who know Jesus, and that's great. And I, I'm so pleased and can stand with them and we can share in the gospel. But I want to tell you that there is more. And if people thirst they can have that thirst quenched through the power of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you've got a need for healing. Well, that can only be met by a God who has the power to do that. I mightn't know much, 
But what I can say is that God will meet our needs. And the way he meets our needs, the Bible says, is according to or in proportion to his riches in glory. Gina Reinhardt is, I think, now the richest woman in the world. I'm not sure who the richest man in the world is. I believe that he's a, um, um, I think it's Mexican guy who's got a um, telecommunications company. I think he's still at number one. It was last time I read that list. I think Bill Gates, poor Bill, Slip down to number two. But I could take the richest man and the richest woman in the world and not one of them could buy me healing. Not one of them. Because their riches don't even begin to compare with the riches of glory. And how is God going to meet your need? Just a little bit. Is that what you expect of God? Just a little bit? Just a little bit? God, I come to you with my need. Just a little bit. When I was young, I um, went to Bible College, Mayas Bible College in Sydney. But I was, as I've told you before, the world's shyest person, the introvert's introvert, just as Paul was the Pharisee's Pharisee. And somehow I managed to get through Bible college without ever having to preach. <laughs> I'm not sure how many people have managed that, but I managed it. And the way I managed it was because I was involved with singing. And there with the guitar and away I'd go. And there was a song we used to sing back then. And I look back at it now thinking, man, how stupid was I singing that? Now I made, I, I've got to tell you this, I made some terrible blunders. One time we went into the hospital and we spoke, and I had the songs that we were going to sing beforehand. And we went into the next song, is going to be this one. And we went into Warden and happened to be um, an intensive care ward. And the song that we had was, If You Only Had Five Minutes More to Live. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Whoops. But there was a song that we used to sing. And I look back now and I go, Man, how crazy. And it was this. Lord, just build me a cabin in the corner of glory land. Oh. Lord, I'm not asking to live with the blessed. Where, where did these words come from? Lord, just build me a cabin in the corner of glory land. You poor God, that's all you can afford. according to his riches in glory. Can you see that God can afford more than a cabin in the corner? You know, the Bible tells us that we're going to a home that's been prepared for us. And I, it boggles my mind to think that God who, who took six days to create this whole magnificent universe and, and the beauty of the sky and stars that we see. He spent 2,000 years building me a mansion. It's no cabin, let me tell you. You see, it's in proportion to his riches in glory. And if that is what he's prepared for me there, and if eternity has already begun now, why are we content for less? Why? Why? God can provide your need, not your wants, not your wish list, but he can provide the needs that he has for you to fulfill the purpose that he has throughout your whole life. My God shall supply all of your need in proportion to his riches in glory. Never, ever, ever let us forget that. And so if you need healing, understand that there's nothing that's too big for God. We're a community. We're created for community. We're called to belong 
to the community of God. Not just to believe, but to belong. We're called to walk with Him and to speak the language of the kingdom, to love one another and to serve one another, to, to walk in the blessings of God. But that same God who wants us to be in community with Him, wants to bless us and walk with us and know that we are sons of the living God. It's what we were made for. It's God's intention for us to live in community with him and to know that he will provide for us. He wants us to declare the kingdom, speak the language of the kingdom, but not just speak it to others, speak it to ourselves so that we get the message loud and clear also, that we can walk with him and know the great blessing and benefits that come with the kingdom. Can we pray? Lord, we just thank you today that, that you are a God of, of greatness to us. Lord, we thank you that you're not a small God that is not interested in our human frailties, but you know us intimately. You know everything about us. You are interested in the smallest detail of our life. And Lord, you love us with a love that is just so great we find it hard to contemplate. Father, just let each one of us this morning understand the realities of God with us. Understand the reality of the place that we have seated in Christ in heavenly places. Understand the purpose that you have for us. Understand the benefits and blessings that you have for us. Lord, help us to walk in it. And Lord, help us to be faithful in declaring your kingdom to this world around us. Encourage us, Lord, to be what you made us to be. In Jesus' name. Amen.